The Challenge of the Yukon. It's King, swiftest and strongest lead dog of the North Country, blazing the trail for Sergeant Preston of the Northwest Mounted Police in his relentless pursuit of lawbreakers. On King! On, you huskies! Gold. Gold discovered in the Yukon. A stampede to the Klondike in the greedy race for riches. Now back to the days of the gold rush, when Sergeant Preston and his wonder dog King battled through storm and snow to preserve law and order as they met the challenge of the Yukon. Far north of the Arctic Circle near Mackenzie Bay, a band of Eskimos were hunting seal. The winter had come suddenly that year, and the freezing wind had covered the vast expanse of water with thick ice. As they approached the bay, Ulak, the leader, suddenly stopped uh, and pointed ahead, talking in his native tongue to Webu, his brother. What is that that moves slowly on the white snow? Oh, it is not a seal or a bear. See, there are two together. They walk first on their hind legs, then crawl on all fours. They are men like us. They fall down and then drag themselves to their feet. Come, we must help them. Uh, uh, they're white men. One is still as if dead. Help us. We've been without any food for days. Whip. Whip. Hey, Edith. Help me with him, Weibo. Uh, he has fallen. The other one. Is he alive? Yes. We must get dogs and sled. We can take them back to village and give them food and shelter. Weeks passed, and the two white men lay in an igloo too weak to help themselves. The Eskimos were kindly and fed them what food they had. And soon the men could sit up and talk to each other. They were alone in the small snow house when Hank Peterson, the stronger of the two, sat up for the first time. Vic Summers, his partner, still lay quietly on his bed of furs. How do you feel, Vic? Still kind of hard for me to breathe. Yeah, there's no air in this stinking hole. And that lamp makes it worse. It's better than freezing. I guess we're lucky to be alive. I wonder if we'll ever be able to find the boat. Wouldn't do us much good with frozen in solid. We should never have taken a chance like that. We were two weeks later than we said we'd be. The schooner couldn't wait for us. It was the winter hidden too soon that really did it. How'd I know the ice would get so thick this time of year? A lot of good the trip did us. You thinking you could get furs trading with Eskimo tribes. We didn't even see any Eskimos until now. You didn't know anything about the country up here. Quit your yapping. We're not through yet. Not through? We're stuck here until the ice melts next spring. Even then, maybe we'll never find the boat. These Eskimos will find it for us as soon as I'm strong enough to go with them. I'm not telling them about it yet, though. Why not? They could be looking for it when they go on their hunting trips. Vic, you haven't been well enough to notice things around here. These Eskimos don't know a thing about white men. There's only one of them who can speak any English at all. What's that got to do with... You realize that right here in this smelly rat's nest, we're sleeping on a fortune in furs? All I noticed was they're warm. The men of this tribe are good hunters. The only reason they hunt is to get food and furs to cover themselves. They don't know the value of them. You think we can trade with them? When we're strong enough, we'll get back to the boat. We've got a lot of cheap junk there that we can trade for valuable furs. These Eskimos haven't any guns. As soon as we're on our feet, we can take over this village. Just the two of us. We'll get every valuable pelt they bring in. And by spring, we'll be out of here rich men. Be quiet. Someone's coming through the snow tunnel. Why, be quiet. They don't know what we're saying. Uh, it's probably that toothless old hag that brings us our dinner every day. Oh, yeah, it's old Ewa. <laughs> soup. <laughs> soup. <laughs> well, the old clone has learned another English word. <laughs> soup, you say? <laughs> soup. Soup. Thanks, Ewa. Thanks for this stuff? Uh, oh, Hank, they're doing their best. Look at that fur collar on her. That's white fox. And that coat, or whatever it is you call it, it's made of sea otter pelts. A fortune in furs on that wrinkled old hag. She's Ulak's mother. 
He's the best hunter in the tribe. That's why he's head man. Oolak. Oolak. She heard me say her son's name. And she's pointing to the white fox fur. Must be a recent present. <laughs> uh, never you mind, Lillian Russell. Just as soon as I get well enough, that'll be the last white fox you'll put around that turkey <laughs> neck of yours. As Hank and Vic recovered, Ulock learned many English words from the white men, and they in turn learned Eskimo. It wasn't long before they could converse freely with each other, and it was then that Hank told Ulock about the boat. You see, Ulock, winter caught us early. Our boat was locked in the ice. I'm afraid that's too hard for him to understand, Hank. All right, you tell him. Yeah, I'll try it. Ulock, you know what boat is? Like kayak. Hmm. Me know. Cold come. Much ice catch boat. Can't go. Where this boat? You savvy where you find us? Huh? Me, me know. It two, three sleeps from there. Boat no go for many sun. We don't want to leave in it. We'll come back here. We got many presents on boat for your people. Hey, don't say that. Present? Yeah. You take us boat? Who luck got strong dog team? Me take a fine boat. Good. We'll leave soon, huh? One sleep, we go. That means you'll start tomorrow. Fine. But I wish you hadn't said that about the presents. We'll have to do that to give them confidence in us. Nah. Tomorrow it is. Tomorrow we start to make our fortune. From the day that Hank and Vic brought back the cheap calico, beads, nails, and small mirrors for trading purposes, life in the peaceful Eskimo village began to change. Hank beamed with satisfaction as he looked at the big stack of pelts he had accumulated. But Vic looked troubled. Look at him, Vic. It's a fortune, and we ain't half started. Those Eskimos are working their heads off to get them. I don't like the way Ulock's acting. The rest of the Eskimos are so anxious to bring in pelts, they don't bring home enough meat for the families. Half the village is hungry. That ain't my fault. I'm not afraid of Ulak. They need those furs for clothes and bedding. Ulak and his brother have stopped trading with us, I notice. Ah. Maybe it's time I showed Ulak that he ain't head man in this tribe anymore. I think that's too dangerous. Ulak isn't a fool. He and his brother are the best hunters and the most intelligent members of the tribe. They're all afraid of my gun. Yesterday, I hit one of them with my dog whip when he tried to trade me a hide with a rip in it. Huh. He crawled like a dog, and I didn't have any trouble. They know who's master now. Yeah, there's Ulux's brother, Weibu. Must be coming home from his trapping. Weibu! Weibu, stop! Wait, man. Want me? Well, you got some nice spurs this trip, didn't you? Oh. Much good hunt. Go on in. And see what you take for him. Oh, me no trade furs and meat. My family cold, hungry. Ulak say no more trade with white man. Oh, he did, did he? But I'll show you whether you'll trade with me or not. Give me that dog with hey, Stop it. Oh, no. Ulak. Ulak. It's oh, White man, stop! Look out, Hank, it's Ulak. Soft. You want a taste of this too, Ulak. <laughs> Me? Get whipped. Get back. I say I've got a gun. Do not hit Ulak. <laughs> Hank, you shot Weibo. White man not kill my people. Me throw a knife. Knife? <laughs> Ulak, you've killed Hank. You threw that knife. White man bad. Him kill brother. Him better dead. Your face is cut, Ulak. Hank slash you with a whip. I'll fix it. White man go. Make pack. Go from village. You, you 
mean I should leave? White men bad for my people. Me tell you go. Tell all white men not come on hunting ground of my people. Me you luck. Me kill them. White man's law says you can't kill people. This Eskimo law. You go. No more white man come here. Me kill. Go. Sergeant Preston of the Northwest Mounted Police had been sent north to the small settlement of Aklavik, where a new post had been started. He sat in the police cabin with Inspector Emerson, a man who had had a great deal of experience in the North Country. We have a big job up here, Sergeant. So I understand, sir. Some of the Eskimos in these parts have never seen a white man. It's our job to educate them, make them understand our ways and our laws. They're quite harmless, aren't they, Inspector? The Eskimos are, generally speaking, a peaceful, happy race. But they are also intelligent and brave. They resent it, naturally, if anyone takes advantage of them. And then they're far from harmless. They have a great deal of racial pride. That's why we must be careful in the administration of justice. I suppose it might be advisable to see the crime through the Eskimos' eyes before we make an arrest. That's it exactly, Sergeant. By wise and fair treatment, we can win their respect and confidence. Oh, uh, I'll get it, sir. Inspector Emerson? He's here. I'm Sergeant Preston. Oh, we got a man out here in our sled. We found him about five miles out of town. Huh? He's almost dead. Guess he got lost in that blizzard a few days ago. Bring him in. Uh, wait, I'll help you. Yeah. He's half out of his head. He's been raving like a lunatic. I'll take his shoulders. You take his feet. Can I help you? We can handle him, thanks. Put him on this couch. Yes, sir. There. Yeah, I'm afraid there ain't much hope for him. He's pretty far gone. You want me to help? Well, he'll take care of him, Jake. I'm glad you brought him here. Uh, you'd better get some brandy, Sergeant, over there in the cupboard. Yes. Uh, let me know if there's anything I can do. We'll do that. Thanks. He should have shot. Ulak. He killed him. That knife, Ulak. Here's the brandy, Inspector. And give him a little. His hands and feet are frozen. I'm afraid there isn't much we can do. Here, take some of this, fella. What is it? Brandy. Swallow it. Good. Now try a little more. All right. Now lie back. You're safe at the mounted police barracks. We'll do all we can for you. He's dead. Eskimo killed him. Is uh, Hank your partner? Yeah. Yep. We were in Eskimo village. Long time. Where is the village? West. West 20 miles. Maybe more. Who was the Eskimo who killed your partner? Ulak. Don't, don't go there. He, he, he said he'd kill any, any white man that came. Uh, take a little more brandy. There you are. <laughs> no, he looks. <laughs> Too late. And what does his Ulak look like? Don't worry, we'll get him for killing your partner. No, no, he wasn't. He, he, uh, oh. He's unconscious, sir. I doubt that he'll come out of it. He's dying. He's in a coma. Well, we can be thankful that he had a few moments of consciousness. We got some information. This looks like your first case up here, Sergeant. He said the Eskimo's name was Bulak, and he had a whiplash across his face. That should help me find him. And he told us one thing that means you'll have to find that village. He said that Ulak would kill any white man who came near it. That's the thing we'll have to prevent. You'd better turn in, Sergeant, and get some sleep. Yes, sir. I'll start out to find that village early tomorrow morning. I'll send Kuik, my best Eskimo guide, with you. He speaks English and Eskimo both. And my advice to you is to send Kuik to the village alone first. He can sound them out about their feeling toward white men. And come back to your camp to report You'll know what to do after that. Yes, sir. I'll get my supplies ready tonight and start the first thing in the morning, Inspector. Sergeant Preston and Kuik had searched for almost a week through the vast snowy wasteland of the Arctic, but had seen no sign of the Eskimo village they were seeking. The following day, however, 
They came upon the former camp of a hunting party. Okay. Oh, Somebody made camp here, Cooey. Ah. Eskimo hunting party here. Hmm? See? Blood on snow. Where them cut up game they kill. Well, that means we must be near their village. Maybe 10, 20 miles. Trail from here not hard to follow. Maybe me go to village now, huh? It better you stay here. You're probably right, Kuik. We'll build an igloo and I'll stay near it till you come back. May take you two or three days. You be all right alone? Don't worry about me. You take the dog team and I'll keep King with me. While you're gone, I'll do some hunting and have some fresh meat by the time you're back. Ah, uh, come. We build snow house. The next day, Sergeant Preston, with King beside him, started out over the rugged terrain that was near Mackenzie Bay. As he topped a rocky ridge that was covered with snow, he saw a black speck move on the smooth surface that stretched out before him. Thinking it might be a seal, he adjusted his binoculars. Wait a minute, King. Clear this ice is bad, huh? See what that is. It's not a seal, it's a man. Crawling on his stomach, what a... It looks like a polar bear over there near those rocks. Below the mountain, a drama was being enacted. An Eskimo was stalking a half-grown polar bear that slept on a small rock nearby. <laughs> Wind's coming this way and you can get their scent, can't you, King? I never saw such patience. That man's moving an inch at a time. So interested was the Mountie in watching the drama below him that he kept the glasses glued to his eyes as he moved to the right to get a clearer view. And then suddenly, the crust of snow on which he stood gave way, and he felt himself falling into a crevice that had been covered by a light crust of snow. A stinging pain shot through Sergeant Preston's right arm as he hit the bottom of the crevice, and he lay half stunned for a moment. My, My arm... I... I can't move my shoulder. King, get help, boy. Get that man. Bring him back. I can't move, fella. My legs hurt, too. Get him, boy. Bring him back here. The Eskimo Ulak smiled to himself as he inched forward on his belly toward Mammoth, the polar bear. He pictured his triumph when he entered the village, having killed a bear alone. No one had ever done this before. And while this animal was not full-grown, it would still be a great victory. Cautiously, he drew his spear, rose to his feet, and hurled it at a spot near the beast's shoulder where it would enter the heart. But just then, Nanos moved, and as the spear struck, the great animal roared with pain and fury. The wound was not fatal, and Ulak raced away, drawing another spear as the bear charged. As Ulak turned to throw the spear, his foot caught on a jagged piece of ice, and with a cry of terror, he fell. It was then that the terror-stricken man saw the form of a huge gray dog launched through the air at the side of the charging beast. The bear reared up on its hind legs, and with a twist of its body sent the dog rolling into the snow. Like a flash, Ulak was on his feet, hurling his spear, which this time found its mark. The bear sprawled in the snow at the Eskimo's feet. Ulak looked with wonder at the big dog that had saved his life. As King came toward him, Ulak spoke to him in Eskimo. You are not a wolf. Did you come from the sky to save me? I owe you my life. Why do you bark and run back? Come. I will give you the best of meat from the carcass of Nanook who would have killed me. Why do you pull at my coat of skin? You are in trouble. You... You are telling me something. Yes. Yes, I will follow. I will follow you. Sergeant Preston lay at the bottom of the shallow crevice, his face twisted with pain. His right arm and shoulder were badly wrenched, and every movement was agony. Then he heard the welcome sound of King's bark. As the Mountie looked up at the opening above him, he suddenly saw the head of a man, the face framed in the fur of his parka, looking down at him. Help! Get me out of here! You white man? Yes. Have you a rope? A line or something? He got line. Seal skin. That'll do it. And think I can tie it around me. Me not like white man. Oh? Where'd you come? Dog, bring me. He'll save my life. Well, maybe you'll get me out of here for him. He's my dog. Uh, me do. 
Poor dog. My arm's hurt, but I can use the other one. I can brace my feet against the side of this wall. Tie the rope to King's harness. He can help pull me up. Lamonti almost fainted with pain as he reached a point where the powerful Eskimo grasped his hand and pulled him to the top. He lay for a moment with his eyes shut and teeth clenched. Then, as the Eskimo bent over him, he looked up into his face and caught his breath as he saw the scar of a whiplash across the cheeks. What? You hurt my, my shoulder and arm. Well, never mind, King. I'll be all right. Storm come. Me go. Could you... Help me get back to my snow house. Me not like white man. So you'll leave me to die here in the storm. Dog, him good. Me help you back to snow house. Thanks. What's your name? Me Ulak. Huh? My dog's name's King. He likes you, Ulak. That tells me you're a good man. I can trust you. Me like dog. Me not like white man. Well, at least you're honest about it. I I can't walk very well, Lula. My ankles hurt. But with you on one side and King on the other, maybe I can make it. Come on before that storm hits. Looks as if we're in for a blizzard. For two days, the terrible Arctic blizzard whistled around the snug house of snow and beat upon its walls with fine pellets of ice hurled by the wild wind. And for two days, Sergeant Preston, with kind words and understanding, gradually melted Ulak's strong prejudice against the white men. When the storm cleared and the sun shone again on the land, the Mountie and the Eskimo were friends. The following day, Ulak had gone out to hunt when Sergeant Preston heard the sound of his dog team, which meant Keok's return. Go out, King. I must be going. Are you all right? Hello, Kuwait. I had an accident, but it's not serious. Blizzard stopped me from coming back. Sergeant, we must go away fast. Huh? What's wrong, Kuwait? Me go to Eskimo village. All people hate white man. Them say white man come, him kill. Who like him head man, him not there. Blizzard stopped him from coming home to village. Him give orders, kill white man. Who looks here with me? He's gone out to hunt. You mean him friendly? Yes, he's friendly Sergeant, enough. Eskimos come. Them know me come from white man's country. Them try kill me. You mean they're after you? Me get away. Your dog team faster. Them come. Them try kill us. They know white man here. We mustn't have any bloodshed. If they look for only here. I know. King. King, boy. King. Go find Ula, King. Find him, King. And bring him back. Him not know what you say. Oh, he must understand. King. Ula, fella. Bring Ula back. Get him, boy. Him. Get him? Yes. He can find him sooner than you could. He'll follow his scent. I hope he's not too far away. Is that a dog team? Our dogs are barking. Me, look out and see. Them come. Six men. Them come fast. They'll be safe in here for a while. They have no guns. When they get close to it, shoot over their heads from the doorway. That'll keep them away from the opening. Oh, uh, they know you're with a white man. Me think maybe they understand. Uh. Me tell them you good man. Me, your guide. Them get very mad. Say, Ulrich, tell them, kill all white man. They're getting close, Kuwik. Be careful when you fire. Shoot over their heads. And stand back from that opening. They can throw spears from a long distance. All right, Kuwik, shoot. Back, Kuwik, get back. That spear came right through the skin covering the opening. Them go back away from door or snow house. Them afraid of guns. Keep watching, Kuwik. Oh, if I could only use my arm. If any of them get near the door, fire the gun over their heads again. Them back of snow house. Listen, what's that? Them try chop holes in snow house. Them all around. Keep watching that opening, Kuwik. I'll watch these walls. I can use my gun with my left hand. I'll fire through the first break they make. You better fire out the door again to scare them. That wall's beginning to crack. I'll have to shoot. Is that King? Me see. King come. Ula come too. Good. Ula, tell them stop. Him say you are friends. Yes, King. Oh, you made it, fella. Oh, you brought him back in time. Good boy. A big crackling fire of driftwood lighted up the snowy clearing in front of the igloo. Sergeant Preston sat on one side of it beside Ulak with King between them. On the other side of the fire sat six of the strongest hunters from Ulak's village. 
huddled into shapeless forms in their heavy furs. The firelight shone on their strong faces as Ulak spoke to them. And they listened intently when Ulak read to them from the paper which Sergeant Preston had given him. He read it slowly in their native tongue. Hear ye, the queen of the land commands you, saying, Thou shalt do no murder. Why does she speak thus? Long ago, our God made the world. He owns the world. The people also he made. And he owns them. The proclamation that Ulak read is the same with a few changes that still hangs in every Indian and Eskimo village in the Yukon Territory and explains how the mounted police are their guardians and protectors. The Eskimos listen solemnly. But when a man commits murder, at once tell the queen's servants, the police, and they will come and bind the murderer, and the ruler shall judge him. Thus, our God commands us, so you are to follow the Queen's command. This man is Sergeant Preston. He is the Queen's servant and our friend. He is white man's law. Thank you, Luck. And now I want to give you a present. This rifle and these bullets. It will make your hunting easier. Tomorrow, I'll show you how to use it. Stick the suit player. Who left now? Great hunter. White man, him, friend. Many thank you. All white man, friend now. You and great dog king. Make it so. <laughs> yes, king. Thanks to you, this case is closed. <laughs> The Challenge of the Yukon, a copyrighted feature, is brought to you each week at this time, and all names and incidents used are fictitious. Listen again next week to another exciting adventure during the days of the gold rush. Fred Foy speaking. This program came to you from Detroit. For 30 minutes of listening loaded with suspense and excitement, it's hard to top the gangbuster show on the air every Saturday night over most of these same ABC stations. Thrilling action is always the keynote of gangbusters, right from the clattering opening of the machine gun and marching feet until the last absorbing minute of this fast-moving program. Every Saturday night, Gangbusters brings you dramatizations of actual cases, fresh from police blotters, of crimes that have threatened the peace and security of our nation. Gangbusters not only serves to make the American public more aware of crime and its danger, it also serves Americans everywhere, by broadcasting up-to-the-minute descriptions of persons currently wanted by some police department in the country. Don't forget, Gangbusters is heard every Saturday night. That's tonight, over most of the...